Hi, everyone. My name is Corley Rosario. Um, I'm probably going to just flip back and forth between English and Spanish. Uh, I will try to repeat myself back in English, but yeah. Um, welcome. Um, this talk is really just about UX tips and tricks. Uh, I do want to kind of focus on giving you good tips and tricks that pertains to the Global Game Jam. So I'm hoping that everything I can talk to you about today will help you with, you know, when you guys are on your teams and you're working very quickly uh, to at least try to incorporate some UX uh, pipeline into, into your development process. Um, without further ado, this is me, um, except, you know, I have purple hair. Um, Corley, I'm senior UX designer. Uh, currently, I am at Niantic uh, in LA. And, you know, a little bit about me. Um, I've worked on multiple projects uh, get, ranging from video games, also on web and uh, apps. So I do have experience kind of just with, you know, mobile platforms mostly. Um, that's just kind of my expertise right now. But, you know, puzzle games, uh, educational space as well, uh, fitness, maps. <laughs> um, uh, before I started at Niantic, I was at Scopely not too long ago, um, working on Wheel of Fortune, and now I'm working on something else I can't really talk about. Uh, aside from the UX work that I do, I'm also very much into public speaking, uh, talking about the UX process as well as just diversity in games and how important it is. Uh, to not only feel represented, but also have people from different backgrounds in, in the actual game making process. Uh, helping people find opportunities in order to come into the video game industry. Um, and mentoring. Uh, I give a lot of workshops. I was at PAX this past year and last year, giving a UX workshop. Um, I give a lot of talks about just what it's like to be in the industry, um, especially as, you know, Puerto Rican, <laughs> there's not too many of us in the industry, or at least I haven't found too many of us. Um, but yeah, like I, I just really like teaching and making sure that people feel like the game industry is an option, uh, a career option for, for them as they grow up. Uh, things that I've worked on uh, very early on, I was working on a tower defense game. Hector, you probably have seen this. <laughs> He was, um, he was our art director for this game. Um, I've also, like I said before, worked at uh, a website slash app that helps surveyors uh, out in the field just kind of like map out the land that they're actually working on. Um, I've worked on fitness apps uh, with a more gamification kind of view on them. Uh, I've worked on a game called, um, well, at the time it was, oh, I forgot, never mind. Um, but yeah, I've worked on MMO RTS style games, kind of like a Clash of Clans meets Mobile Strike, kind of. Um, the game has changed a lot since, but, but when I was working on it, this was kind of like what the game looked like. Um, I've also worked in the educational space with Samsung Kids and a little bit on Kodomi. Um, just kind of really helping on the onboarding process for these game, uh, these apps. Uh, I've worked with AR products as well. And again, within the educational space. And the last thing I worked on before joining Niantic was Wheel of Fortune, which is a, you know, puzzle game. <laughs> And, you know, really a lot of the questions that I, I have people like ask me, you know, what is UX? What exactly is that a UX designer does that is so different from just a game designer? And OX, uh, UX really is the overall experience of, you know, having a person use your product, whether it's a website, an app, a game. Um, and it has a special emphasis on how easy or pleasing it is to use. And I think a lot of times people think UX just limits itself to wireframes or, 
or just like the actual deliverables that we give people. Um, but really UX starts the moment the player knows that your product exists. The player or user is already forming opinions and forming even biases as well <laughs> of what it is that you're going to give them. So UX starts at that point. And my job is to make sure that, you know, that brand awareness, um, that making sure that, you know, this is a good experience for them permeates throughout the entire development process, all the way to when it's finally shipped, it's in their hands. And even after that, after the player has a, actually has that in their hands and, and, you know, they're playing it on the screen, whatever, tweaking things to make sure that we're improving the experience over time. Um, but if we really were to go ahead and just kind of like talk, well, what is, what exactly are the components of UX? What exactly am I measuring it against? Um, there are some like basic foundational, um, yeah, components. Uh, is this game or is this app or is this product useful to me? Um, is it usable? Is it something that I can actually navigate through the entire HUD or all the UI and actually be able to find exactly what I need uh, through, through the, the UI elements? Um, is it desirable? Is it something that when I play through it, it inspires me a little bit? It's something that like, oh, this is great. I want to keep using this product. Is it findable? Uh, when I'm using this product, am I able to find the things I need within it? in order to reach the task that I want to reach in, in the game, again, in the app, just in case. Sometimes I'll say product, sometimes I'll say game. I pretty much mean the same thing. Um, it's just because I've worked on so many different types of products, um, I, I tend to find it easier to just refer everything to a product. But sometimes, you know, it could be an app, it could be a website, it could be a game, it could also just be a general experience. Uh, when I say product, I mean all of that. Is it accessible? Uh, is this a product that no matter if, you know, I'm my grandmother or a person who has difficulty seeing or has uh, problems with their motor skills, and this can range from people who do have uh, certain disabilities to maybe just a child that just has really refined their motor skills, uh, is my product accessible to them? Uh, and is it credible? Is this a product that's going to instill trust in me when I use it? Uh, do I feel good actually using this product? And I don't feel like it's going to scam me or try to mine me for information or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, but really, you know, at the end of it, like my job is to make sure that I'm advocating for you, the player, <laughs> uh, with for my team and making sure that my team is creating a better gaming experience because of that. Uh, that's really my responsibility, responsibility, understanding and advocating for someone that honestly I don't know, but I have to be able to bring forward those, those skills. Um, a lot of people also just kind of get confused between UX and UI. Um, there is a clear difference between UX and UI, but it doesn't mean that they work independently of each other. Um, when I talk about UX, I am talking about interaction design and, and you know, deliverables would be like wireframes, prototypes, flow charts, any sort of type of information and architecture, even user research and user stories and user scenarios and that kind of thing are all predominantly on the UX side. On the UI side, we are talking about you know, the visual design, how color is being used, uh, layout, typography, um, animation as well. All of that is more on the UI side, but it again, it isn't that we're separate from each other. We work very, very closely and, and, and pre it's pretty enmeshed process. Uh, it's also why you sometimes see like job postings that say like UI slash UX designer. Um, typically it's better if two people are, are doing these things um, and working alongside each other, but in my case, I am now just a UX designer. 
Again, doesn't mean I don't do the other things or don't take those into consideration, but this is my main focus on this side. And really what I look at as a UX designer are the motivations and values that players have when you know they're playing our games or what they're looking for when they're when they're looking to play a game you know why do they play this what motivations are determining the behaviors in the game what's making them fall in love with a game and what keeps them coming back and a little a lot of this does cross over into player psychology um i do have like a little bit of experience with and, and most of it is like self-taught as well, uh, to look for just these answers through players, like how to ask the right questions, how to distill the information that your players are giving you regarding, you know, the questions that you are asking. Um, but yeah. And before I go into like the tips and tricks kind of section, I do want to take like a quick step back into talking about soft skills. And, and the reason I do this is we're so quick to go into the actual technical side of things that we don't realize that there's a multitude of soft skills that we also need to develop or need to leverage um, in order to be able to do the jobs that we do. With artists, it might be observation. Uh, with people who are data analysts, it's just being able to quickly process information. Uh, with UX, it's kind of the same deal as well. And if any of you have ever heard me talk before, you kind of probably know what's coming up right now. Um, the very first soft skill I always tell people that you need to be a UX designer is really empathy. Um, I cannot do my job if I don't have empathy. I need to be able to understand another person and put myself in their shoes in order to bring that experience into the room with me, with my dev, uh, with my team and the other devs on our team um, and to be able to advocate for them. I need to be able to explain why this specific design or what we're building out and the way that we're building it out is going to affect our users for better or worse. Um, and to be able to provide better solutions in order to, to make sure that they have a great experience. Uh, empathy comes really, really uh, strongly into play for this. Uh, observation. I do need observation skills. Um, you know, I do, we do a lot of research, uh, user testing and such. And even things as small as just your body language says a lot about how a player feels uh, with the game or the experience that, that they're playing through. And, you know, if someone goes kind of like, like that, that's already telling me, okay, there's a, there's a problem here. And during user testing, I'll actually go ahead and like, so can you tell me what's going on? Um, what are you currently doing right now? And try to understand why they made that face or why they kind of like flinched or, or why they laughed at something. Um, we wanna understand those behaviors and, and what the player is thinking. Um, and also just general observations about, you know, Again, what your team is trying to build. Um, imagining as well. The future thinking, almost. Uh, what could happen if we move forward with, with that feature? Uh, another thing, I ask why a lot. <laughs> not to seem confrontative or anything like that. I'm actually like not confrontative at all, guys. Um, but I do want to understand why we're making the decisions that we're making. And you know, why this specific demographic? Why that specific design? Why that strategy? What are our goals? What are we trying to achieve? Um, and a lot of what I do is just to question assumptions and biases uh, based around what we're building. Um, and just to give you an example, you know, they say that the typical demographic for gamers is like, you know, in the 30s, male, white. And why is that, you know, the only demographic? Uh, why can't we make our game for other demographics? What would we have to change in our game and in our features in order to attract other demographics? Because at the end of the day, 
even though you are building a game for, you know, the people that you think are going to enjoy it the most. Um, you shouldn't limit to that at all, and especially if you want to be more representative and more inclusive in, in your designs and everything. Um, I truly do feel that, you know, if you can cast a slightly wider net, it might be better. Um, but also knowing exactly what the type of players that you're looking for is important. So you just kind of like, again, ask why. And, you know, part of my job as well is to problem solve. Or it's almost, mm, sorry about that. It's almost um, kind of like my design philosophy or, or just the way I am. Um, I come up, we come up as a team with a hypothesis. Uh, this is the feature. This is what we think it's going to achieve. Um, and we test it to see if that's true or not. And it's similar to the scientific method because of that. Uh, we try to understand the problem and find, you know, multiple solutions to it. And you have to be really resourceful as well with your problem solving capabilities. And I think this is the last one. Um, really, really important no matter what you do on your team if you're again if you're a designer if you're a producer if you're an artist doesn't matter communication and collaboration is incredibly important um you need to be mindful that you're actually on a team with other people and all of you are creating this game together you can't work in a silo you have to be bouncing ideas off each other constantly um, so you need to be able, and because you're working with other people, like not everyone is going to have the same sort of language that you do. So you need to be able to adapt to other people's communication styles as well. Um, you have to be able to communi communicate both visually and spoken or written in a very effective way. Um, I've worked with people that they see a wireframe, they have no idea what that wireframe means. It isn't until the very, very end polish that they finally understand what, you know, what that feature was supposed to really be about. And just being able to communicate that with that person verbally, um, trying to supplement with other visual resources. One thing I really, really like to do and I really recommend a lot of UX designers, um, no other UX designers do and recommend other people do, is build quick prototypes, either a paper prototype or something on device, something that you can put in the other person's hand um, for them to just kind of tap through. You can use Envision, you can use Proto.io, which is what I use, um, Sketch, I believe as well, Adobe XD, whatever it is, just put something in their hand and that's gonna just immensely help with communication, especially, again, when it comes to the designer feature of something, and especially if you're getting pushback on it. Um, but then, with UX overall, there, there's kind of like, well, where does UX fit? Um, typically, I'm kind of put here in between design and art. More often than not, I'm supposed to be my own department. <laughs> Um, but they kind of fit me usually or fit us usually between design and art and, and it really, yeah, like most of the work or the bulk of the work that I do is between those two. But UX is involved in every single step of the way and even after a game comes out. So I am involved with our producers, with our GMs, with our our feature owners or game leads, sometimes I'm a feature owner, uh, with our artists, with our game designers, with sometimes even animation, and even on the engineering side, I'm constantly talking to our client engineers, our QA people, and depending on the feature, um, for example, if it's an optimization feature or something that we're just trying to make better and improve, I might even be talking to server and backend. Um, to figure out when the game or when the product is gonna ping the server and then back and how that's gonna affect the user's experience. Because if you're in the middle of a game and all of a sudden the server is being pinged and it's stopping your gameplay, we don't want that to happen. So it's kind of planning with server to make sure that 
anything that's being managed on the back end isn't affecting uh, the user directly or their experience directly. And as for actual deliverables, like what does UX look like? Um, so this is kind of an example. Uh, these are some older works that I did uh, for other projects. But, you know, I, again, I work on flowcharts. Um, I work on wireframes that kind of look like black and white mocks, like simple squares. Uh, sometimes I go a little bit further depending on what where in the process of the game I'm at. Um, if we do have like a fully fleshed out game and I'm just fixing things, I will grab screenshots and just kind of like Photoshop things and, and do that sort of thing. Um, prototypes, like I mentioned before, is definitely another type of de deliverable that I, I give to, to my team. Uh, sometimes my work looks a little more like this, where again, uh, here on on the left side is kind of pushing closer to almost, almost a finished product. Uh, definitely still needs some artwork and stuff like that, but it is using assets that already exist in, in our repository or in a game or, or whatever, and just rearranging things. Uh, the one on the right is again, still just kind of blocking things out and describing how something is supposed to work. Um, all my wireframes describe exactly how something works. And I will label things. Um, I'll call out things like, if the player does this, make sure to include this other state, blah, blah, blah. And other things that I do, I also call out state changes. Um, if an icon is in an empty state, an unclicked state, a selected state, uh, if something is being filled, if it's idling, like all those things I do call out and I'll show like a basic concept of what that should look like. Um, animations, if something like is filling, I'll explain what I'm expecting the team to kind of just go through or, or build out. Um, other times I will like if, if we don't really know exactly how an animation or how a certain interaction is gonna animate from screen to screen or from moment to moment, I will create storyboards. I, you know, they're UX storyboards. Uh, I will kind of like animate them, you know, or put them as, uh, together as a GIF if it helps communicate with the rest of my team exactly what I'm expecting. I always caveat that with like, remember this is a concept it's okay if we, in, in polishing and all this stuff, like we deviate from it a little bit, or especially if we feel like this is just not working. Uh, if the visuals aren't exactly the same, that's totally fine. In fact, I expect it not to be the same. Um, but as long as the main concept is there, that's really what I'm trying to communicate. When the player taps this button, what happens? That's kind of boiled down. <laughs> That's kind of my job. Um, and then, all right, going into like just quick UX tips and tricks, uh, especially for a game jam. Um, again, I'm not going to go into full, like, as a UX designer, this is like something I recommend you as another UX designer do. I'm not, I'm not going to do something like that. This is more just for people that know very little about UX design or know very little how to include UX design into their process. Um, these are just like some pretty standard tips and tricks uh, to help you, especially during the game jam. Uh, one of the very, very first things, and I say this a lot as well, talk to players. Talk to your players, people. Talk to people, <laughs> period. Don't just create something in a silo. Remember that what you're creating, someone else is going to be playing it. And you need to find out what the expectations are from those people. Again, what their values are, their motivations are, so that you can start understanding exactly who you're making this game for. This 
is probably, if, if nothing else you take out of this presentation, this right here. Talk to your players. Um, as you're starting your, your game jam, and you're, you know, you have your teams and, and you've already kind of know what the concept is. I'm not sure if we know exactly what it is yet. And, and sorry if, if someone can like write in the comments if we know what the prompt is yet. Um, but as you're starting to flesh out what the game is going to be like, mind mapping is an incredible tool to help you just figure out like all the features that are involved in making that experience or that game. Uh, especially if you're just making like a MVP or vertical slice or, or something just like very small, very contained, like a proof of concept. Um, my mind mapping is going to help you figure out exactly how much work is going to go into making that specific feature. And this is going to help you just kind of like, okay, we're not going to do that. We can't do an MMO world, you know, open world kind of experience. Uh, we don't have time for that in 48 hours. Um, an inventory system. Actually, we might have time for that. Um, basic gameplay, um, you know, a level, obviously. But again, mind mapping is just gonna help you understand exactly what each part of your game is gonna need. And it's just gonna help you reduce scope, which is exactly what you need when you're doing a game jam, um, especially a 48 hour game jam. Scope is your friend. Do not feature creep. Uh, the l second thing I'm, well, third thing, yeah, I'm gonna recommend uh, is leveraging your Bartles player types. Uh, if you're a game designer, you chances are you probably know what I'm talking about, but players are on the game design side. Uh, players can be divided into different types of players, uh, depending, again, on what they value, what their behavior is like in game, uh, all sorts of factors and you can actually while you're designing your features keep in mind you know the type of players that would be playing your game if you know killers are going to be playing in your game you kind of just come back to the play, uh, Bartles player types to understand okay as a killer what exactly are they looking for at a very high level um, sort of feeling uh, sort of, again, the motivations, those values, like what does a killer value when they're going through an experience? Well, killers are really focused on winning, obviously, but a lot of it is also like that sort of power that they can exert over another person and, and kind of flexing that power as well. So when we build out this feature, does that help uh, a killer experience, you know, that sort of power trip of sorts. Um, and if it doesn't, then, you know, you kind of have to go back on the feature, go back on the design and, and try to tweak it and iterate on it until you feel that like it's there. Like, yes, a killer would enjoy this experience because it's kind of like ticking all those boxes of what they value and, and what motivates them to keep coming back to a game. Um, same thing for achievers, socialites, explorers, like each one has a different value. If this, is, if this chart is completely new to you, definitely recommend looking up Bartle's player types uh, and just kind of leveraging that with your UX process, which I'll continue to go through in a, in a bit. Um, along with your Bartle's player types, uh, I would probably use it in combination with empathy mapping uh, because it'll give you a better look into, again, the type of players that you're expecting to play this game. And empathy mapping is really looking at all the internal and external factors that affect a person's approach or perception about games, sometimes in general, sometimes about a feature, sometimes just about experiences. Um, so we look at, you know, our think and feel, we, what aspirations does this person have in regards to the type of game that you're making, uh, what really matters to them, like deep, deep down, like 
is it really about killing people or is it more about the feeling of accomplishment? Uh, is it, I don't know, is it about collecting or, or is it more about having the one thing that no one else has, feeling unique? Um, every single value and motivation can be distilled to a very, very basic um, sort of thought or behavior. So what really matters to this player? What kind of hopes and aspirations, again, do, does this player have uh, within here? When they're having conversations with other people about the games that they play, like, what are others saying about games? Oh, like, you know, casual games, those suck. It's just like a different demographic, but um, what is family saying about it? Oh, you're spending too much money on this game. Like, no, like, that's, that's super bad. Or, or the opposite, like, this game is amazing. I want to play this with you. Um, we see that a lot as well, like just family members playing games with each other. Uh, what is, you know, people like your boss saying? What are friends saying about game playing habits? Or just this type of genre in general? Uh, C, you know, your environment, your community, any sort of influences, uh, friends. Uh, am I seeing a lot of ads about D&D &D or Fortnite or or any sort of game that's out there, like what is the context of those ads? Does it have a very sort of like typical male-centric kind of view? <laughs> or is it a game that, you know, seems more inviting, seems something that like I really do want to try it out, like I, I feel that this community might actually be what I'm looking for. Um, if you go to church, what does church say <laughs> about, you know, your the games that are out there um, and again any other influences that might might affect that even social media as well falls into that uh, your say and do so this person this player you know things as I don't want to say it's shallow because it's not but just the general appearance does say a lot about their game playing habits as well uh, their attitudes in public or just their behavior towards others in general, either in games or outside of games. Uh, what do they do on a day-to-day -day basis? Do they commute every day? How long is that commute? Uh, do they work? Do they go to school? Are they children? Are they adults? Are they, do they have children? Um, is it a mother, you know? Um, like all those things are again, just gonna help flesh out this game. And then any sort of pains, like fears, frustration, frustrations, obstacles. What is the thing that will make your player just completely stop, like just drop off from your game and never return? Uh, you don't want that. <laughs> so try to like make sure you're designing around making that not happen. And any sort of gains, um, desires, needs, and most importantly, how people measure success. And, and if anything, I, I would say that's one of the most important things. Because uh, the way I measure success and you measure, measure success is probably very, very different. For me, as a player, for me, success is defined by how useful I was. That's why I typically play a lot of support roles or you know just knocking someone out for the sake of knocking them out I mean it's nice you know you got to win but if I want to feel that moment of like yes you know it's usually in combination with other people and it's how it's measured by how useful I was to other people uh, not everyone measures success that same way you know so empathy mapping is going to really help you just flesh out exactly who you're creating games for. And it leads into being able to start mapping out user journeys. Um, so if I know I have this player or this type of person coming into this game, they are on a train, on a commute, and they take out their phone and they boot up a game. And... What you're doing with user journeys is knowing everything you know about the player 
back in empathy mapping and, and usually empathy mapping you create a persona but with game jams because you have so little time you might need to bypass that step and for a game jam that's okay in an actual like day-to-day -day, you, you kind of do need personas uh, but with the user journey with the information that you know from your empathy map you're going to take it and start fleshing out a user journey of every step of the way leading up to the final goal that you want a person to achieve you know like i just mentioned before uh let's say and i'm going to try and give a specific example for this one let's say i want to like my goal for the day or my goal for that moment as soon as i log in as a player i want to be able to play a round of a puzzle so step by step I'm on my bus, I pull out my phone, I tap on the icon for the game that I want to play, because I already have it installed in my case, I already have it installed on, on my phone. Tap on the, the icon, it boots up, I'm waiting it for it to load, finally see my home screen, go ahead and tap the play button. Um, when I play, when I tap play, there's some sort of event happening uh, tap OK and then move on into the actual show and then the actual show itself does have multiple steps uh, with for example Wheel of Fortune you start by spinning you guess uh, you land on a wedge you guess a letter and then that letter either shows up or doesn't show up on the puzzle if it shows up then you you know you, you get like the money that comes into you, into your profile and everything, um, but really, what you're doing is like mapping out all the steps the actual player is doing, and this way you know exactly how much trip up that player might have or might not, um, and it helps you just again design a better feature for for the game that you're putting together. If you know that at a certain point there might be like, well, like a pain point, um, then you know you have to kind of focus on that portion. And to give you an example, poor Wi-Fi, or at that point like your game just doesn't want to connect to the server, then what are you doing as a, a de as a developer to make sure that you're communicating what's going on to the player at that point? And with the user journey, you can actually like, just kind of like, okay, this is where that's happening. Let's, let's take a look at that. Um, another really, really helpful thing to use are user stories. And especially with an agile development, um, which is kind of what you guys are gonna be doing for the game jam a little bit. Uh, this is super helpful. Instead of focusing on the actual pieces of the feature that you're building, you're changing the conversation up a little bit to be more about, more player centric, more about, okay, what does our player want to accomplish and for what reason? And this is kind of just the formula for it. You know, as a type of user, I want to achieve a goal so that I, you know, for, for a specific reason. And here are some examples, like as a player, I can hit my enemy multiple times for a multi-hit combo. Um, as a player, I can indicate which Pokemon I want to keep and not accidentally turn into candy, for those who play Pokemon Go. Um, as a player, I can create a chat with my guild to organize raids. And what we're doing is that instead of in a GDD or in, in a spec, kind of just like sectioning off parts of the feature, we're bringing the conversation back to what the player wants to achieve again. And these can actually be turned into tickets in JIRA or like, you know, just post-it notes, which I'm going to go into a little bit in a bit, um, to help track the status of what exactly you're, you're building out. Um, these tickets can definitely include like multiple things within it and obviously an explanation of what this you know sentence actually means or what's contained 
uh, all the art assets that need to be made for it, all that stuff. But again, it's just shifting the conversation back to be more player centric rather than feature centric. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is really good for agile teams. It's best as a Jira ticket or Trello tasks. Um, give it a try, see how it goes. But if you feel it's not working, then that's fine too. Um, but if you do want to include a bit of a UX process into, into the next 48 hours, um, this is actually a pretty good uh, way to do that. Uh, definitely look at some online sites that talk a little bit more about user stories. Uh, Scrum board is actually incredibly useful as well. Uh, this isn't specific to UX, but it's actually a lot of things, uh, a lot of places I've worked at, we've used uh, scrum boards before. And especially when you're trying to iterate on something very, very quickly or push something out very quickly as a 48 hour game jam, uh, having a physical scrum board is super useful. And what you wanna do is have multiple columns. You know, you have your to-dos, you have your in progress, what's been completed, and a separate section for blocked as well is actually really good. And your to-dos, each post-it note is gonna have parts of the feature that should be worked on. Anything in progress is what people are currently working on. And once it's complete, you move, you know, you're, you're moving post-it note from one column to the next. And then when it's complete, it's complete and it's done and it's that, that's it. Um, if something is in the block section, that means that that has to have eyes on it immediately in order to unblock other people. Because remember, you're still working with other people uh, to create something together. If I'm blocked because you haven't been able to finish, I don't know, um, a paragraph about how this feature is supposed to, or a section of this feature is supposed to work, then we need to sit down and have a chat about that before I can get unblocked. Um, again, this is not specific to UX, but I definitely do recommend this for the, the global game jam. And having it physical rather than like digital does help other people that maybe they don't work too well with organization on the computer side of things. You can set it up on like what they did here on a whiteboard. You can put it on a wall, which is um, what I've worked with before. I actually have taken over complete walls with this sort of system, but yeah. Um, and then finding references uh, as game designers, as people that work in games and entertainment as a whole, uh, we should be constantly reaching out to the references we have around us. So play everything, try different apps, and adopt from other sources. Uh, I, people often ask, like, what are my favorite games or what I'm playing right now? That's the one I get a lot. Uh, and honestly, at any given time, I can be playing between five to 20 different games, none of which I particularly enjoy. But it's because I'm doing a lot of research. I'm doing a lot of market research, a lot of just understanding what's out there, um, what people are doing right or wrong, or not even necessarily that, um, looking at what we can adopt into any sort of feature that we're working on, how we can maybe put a spin on it, make it a little bit different. Um, everyone does this. <laughs> uh, trying different apps as well that aren't game focused. Um, today, just to give you an example, I was thinking about Waze and how Waze lets you actually uh, put any sort of in, um, situations that happen when you're like on the freeway or, or just driving. Uh, if there was a crash on ways you can actually go into the map and kind of like say, hey, there was a crash here and place that on the map. And I was just thinking about, well, you know, that would be cool uh, if I could do something with that in a game. You know, like, is there a way I can gamify that? Um, a again, adopt from other sources, it, regardless if it's from video games, apps, web, heck, even movies. Um, we, we have to constantly be consuming information around us and coming back to that. Um, 
I guess this is more like a tip rather than anything else, but like you don't always have to reinvent the wheel, especially if the wheel works for what you need right now. Um, and especially if you're trying to just push out something quick. If you already know an existing design works for the type of genre that you're making, it, it's fine for now. You, you, you can build this first and then move on to iterating it afterwards. Um, but you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. You can put a spin on it, but... Um, on the design side, you know, use what's necessary. Um, design around the context that the player is currently going through. And to give you guys an example, imagine a HUD. Uh, for those who don't know what HUD means, it's uh, heads-up display. Um, it's when you're actually playing a game, like all the UI elements that are all around the, the screen itself. You know, your resources, your health, your, your shield, if you have one. Uh, your ammo if you're playing a first-person shooter, um, your inventory, like all those things are showing up on your screen. Um, so imagine a game where the HUD is filled with literally all the UI elements on the screen at the same time. That sounds a, like kind of a nightmare. <laughs> um, you don't really want to do that. It's just going to be information overload for your players. Uh, they won't know what to look at. They don't know exactly what should be emphasized on. They, they just have information in front of them all the time, all the time. And their brain has to work overtime in order to parse that information. So we really don't want to do that. Um, what we really want to do is actually design elements to change, adapt, display, uh, based on the player's action and environment, uh, environmental context within the game. So... I know there's an enemy out there somewhere um, with HUD that's on screen all the time. It might be in the way of a little arrow that's kind of pointing in the direction of my enemy at all times. Unless there's like a specific reason why I want to go to that enemy. Maybe it's the boss and that's why there's an arrow pointing in that direction. That arrow doesn't really need to be there. Um, as I encounter enemies, the UI should adapt to kind of display any sort of other UI for enemies that are close to me. But otherwise, if, especially if an enemy is really far away, and if there's no specific reason why I should be interacting with that enemy, or any specific goal, there's, again, no reason why that UI should exist on the screen. So it should be more contextual. Yay! <laughs> um, another tip make sure you're designing for accessibility uh, a lot of games just completely forget about this you know and accessibility really does include anyone it isn't that we're just like targeting specific demographics or anything it really does include everybody so for example visual um, people you know are blind or people have low vision or maybe they can't, uh, they have the condition where they can't see in the middle of their, not peripheral, but their sight, but they can see around it. Um, obstruction, um, color blindness is definitely a thing. Um, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I, I believe it was like 10 to 14% of the male population is colorblind. That's a lot of people. It doesn't seem like a lot, but that is a lot of people. Um, and even just normal processes of aging eyesight, like your parents, your grandparents can't read small text. So you have to make sure that when you have captions on, when you have story being showed or shown or anything, that the size of the text is large enough to where no one has to do like this, you know, and, and put their screen like super, super close to be able to read it, that the, it can be read at any size or even changed in settings. And make it a little bit bigger. Um, auditory, you know, failing to provide other options like captions or, or different types of captions. Um, maybe instead of white, it's yellow because like this game has a lot of white on white and you just won't be able to see the caption if it's white on white. Um, anyone with impaired hearing or conditions like APD. So APD 
uh, for those who don't know, is auditory processing uh, disorder. It's, um, it's something that happens in the brain where sound is coming in, but it's not being processed quickly enough, or sometimes not at all. And you, people just can't understand what you're saying. So having something visual in front of them, like captions, helps people like that. Motor skills, uh, any sort of motor impairments that may we need, you know, extra technology or assisted technology in order to let them actually play the game. Um, and cognitive, um, people with dyslexia, uh, people that are on the spectrum, um, any sort of conditions that just kind of like impair processing of information, uh, your game should kind of help with that, or at least ease their experience with the game. Yeah. And I wanted to include this one uh, just because it, it is usually like the most common thing people go to is like well, color blindness and they kind of stop there. I'm kind of forcing you guys to go a little bit beyond that. But again, color blindness is a thing. Um, Puzzle Fighter, I'm hoping a lot of people remember this game. The top is kind of like the actual colors that currently, uh, that people without color blindness see. The bottom is, you know, people with color, a type of color blindness see. And if you see on the bottom, uh, especially the gems, they kind of like bleed into each other and it's actually very difficult to distinguish one type of gem from the next. Uh, especially the greens and reds are, can be very, very difficult. So one way you can mitigate this, especially if you are creating like a match three game, is making sure that the shape of the gems are different or there's some sort of animation on them um, or trying to design your color schemes into more like the yellow and blue tones uh, with different values and stuff like that. And it could still work perfectly as, as a design. Um, a lot of games that are doing that right now, and whites as well, a lot of game, successful games that are doing that right now, is Overwatch is one, uh, Fortnite is another. If you look at their UI, almost every single tone is a variation of yellow or blue or white or black. And some things are more transparent, some are more opaque. But it, it works, it's accessible design. And a lot of games are kind of starting to move in that direction. Um, so why shouldn't you? <laughs> Hand placement. Um, so like I said before, I'm, my, most of my experience has been on like the mobile side of things. So I'm just gonna give you tips for the mobile side. Um, the way people hold phones differs from person to person, but it also differs from game type to game type. So you wanna make sure that your layout is going to meet that positioning. Um, and just to give you an idea, you know, left-handed people, we're holding phone, I'm not left-handed, but <laughs> uh, when we hold phones, we're, we're holding it like this, you know, it's being held on the back there and our thumb has a certain reach around the screen area. And we have to keep in mind that there's only so much my thumb can do uh, within that reach. And, you know, with, with what I'm showing right now, um, the green areas are kind of just like the normal positioning of your thumb. Uh, the yellow areas are kind of like where your thumb is actually starting to stretch a little bit and it's kind of uncomfortable. You might have to reposition your hand on, on the device. Um, and then the red areas are actually hard. It's, it's like the areas that's almost impossible for a player to actually reach those areas or that UI unless they full on like use the other hand or, or reposition their hand completely on the, de on the device. Same thing for right-handed. Um, natural, I think is, uh, sorry, combined is when you're using like, you know, texting and that kind of stuff is like very, very normal to see that kind. Uh, that kind of position, but some games in portrait do allow you to go ahead and use both hands. Um, 
Same thing if you're in landscape. The, the sections are going to change a little bit. Um, but it also changes from screen or device type to device type and ratio to ratio. Um, the hand, my positioning or hand position on, for example, an iPhone, iPhone X is going to be completely different from this device, <laughs> from like just a, a regular standard Android device. Um, so if you're designing across different ratios, make sure that you're kind of repositioning things in, in a way that your player can still reach the UI on the screen. Um, yeah, and then copy is another really important tip I recommend. Um, I actually worked on this not too long ago, but it's just a basic example. Um, making sure that any sort of CTA or any sort of actionable thing you want players to do makes it very clear the action that they need to take. And cop that's why copy matters. And this is a very, again, basic example. Um, just agreeing to a terms of service. By continuing to play, you agree to gaming's terms of service. Okay. Okay, what? You know, this, this, this is no sort of affirmative uh, action that a player is kind of taking. I'm just okaying this, but what exactly am I okaying to? So a variation of this that kind of like looks more at the copy and, and reinforces the copy itself. And by continuing to play, you agree to Game Inc.'s terms of service. A link to the terms of service, a link to the privacy pro, uh, policy, and a button that says continue. And the reason continue, or alternately play as well works, is because it's reinforcing what's already in the body at the top. So they know that by tapping continue, they are taking a conscious action of agreeing to that terms and service. And, th and that's really what I mean about it. And this, again, bleeds across the entire game itself. Um, it's, I just wanted to use this example for it, but it could be, you know, when you send your troops out to fight, you don't want to say just, okay, I'm ready to fight. You know, you, you want something more affirmative than that, something more to contextual than that, um, that reaffirms exactly what it is the player is doing. Uh, if you are working on a Fatui, please make sure you paste the Fatui. You don't want to overwhelm your players by just like giving them a bunch of information at the same time. Um, you want to introduce your features contextually, especially teaching them, you know, learn by teaching, uh, having them learn through your teaching rather than just telling them what to do and that's it. And then they do it after the fact. Um, because we as human beings learn better when we're doing something. Uh, and then as for the Fatui itself, don't just introduce a Fatui and expect a player to remember later on how to use a feature uh, outside of the Fatui. Uh, be sure to like, you know, the reason we want to do this is like we want to reduce recall and we want to like emphasize recognition. Our brains can actually handle so much at a time and we typically only really handle well one task at a time. Uh, our brains are really not set up for multitasking. Like I know people say they're amazing multitaskers. It's actually not great if you're multitasking too much. Um, so we want to reduce recall, try to reduce leaning on a player's memory and emphasize recognition, emphasize like, oh yeah, like I remember something about that. Can you teach me how to kind of do it again? And really that's what we want to do. We want to reinforce the learning through gameplay. Um, if you taught me how to fight and then later on, like I don't fight again until several steps later of the Fatui or even like way after the Fatui, during the actual fight, it would be really great if you can like you know, maybe like a tooltip or something like, hey, remember, you can tap on this to use that special power up. Um, and that's contextual and it goes away 
and the reason it's contextual is because I haven't tapped on that button in a while. And whatever is happening in the fight is actually probably the perfect moment to use that special ability. But the game is recognizing, hey, you're not tapping on this yet. Why aren't you tapping on this yet? And that's when it sends the reminder, like, hey, remember, you can tap on this in order to do the thing. Um, so yeah, just reinforcing that learning through gameplay is it's good UX. Um, and the very last thing, talk to players. You've done all of this work and throughout the process, you haven't talked to anybody. That's really bad. Um, so go ahead and throughout the process, like reach out, especially during the game jam, just quickly, you know, go to someone, hey, reach out, like, hey, can I show you something real quick? You're not on this project and that's great because you, it's a fresh pair of eyes. Um, have them go through the experience and let them talk to you about their experience. Let them, you know, ask them questions like, what did you think about this? What did you know, think about like deploying my troops? What did you think about, you know, the actual fighting? Uh, what did you think was missing? Um, and, and just watch them play. Do not tell them how to play. Do not tell them how to play. Oh my God, do not tell them how to play. Um, let them figure it out on their own. And I mean, controls wise, yes. Let them know like what controls they're supposed to be using, especially if they're using a keyboard. But don't tell them what to do. Um, and just watch them play and take notes and talk to them. But yeah. So go out, do the thing. I believe in you. Um, pump out a really, really awesome game together. Have fun. Please have fun. And I'm going to be staying back a little bit in order, in case you guys have any questions. Um, just in case if you do want to follow me on Twitter, it's Korapiki. Um, I'm also on Facebook. It's actually probably the better way you can reach out to me. But if you just want to like Twitter, you know, do the tweets. It's a thing. Um, you can reach out to me there. Hey, Manny. Um, so Manny's question, I have planned my UI and made the design, but when I put it in the game, it's not looking like I'm in the engine. Do you have tips? So I'm not too sure what you mean by that, Manny. Um, is it that the editor isn't like putting things correctly in the places you want it to be put? Or is it that you put a mock-up together and it's not really like working? Like conceptually it's not working? Because it, if it's just the editor is not... So I'm ashamed. Um, I don't work in Unity anymore. Uh, di not directly. Uh, I haven't worked in Unity for about three or four years now. Um, even though pretty much all the games I've worked on have been in Unity. And it's because, you know, we have really capable teams and we have people on the client side or UI artists that know how to put things in the game itself and make sure that, you know, it's dynamic or it's positioned or anchored the way it's supposed to. Um, I can't give tips like that just because I'm no longer on the actual implementation side of things anymore. Um, but I would say, like, if that's what's going on, I would say talking to an engineer, talking to especially a client side engineer, or talking to an, a UI artist, again, that does implementation is going to be your best bet. Um, if it's more conceptually, the icons just aren't working on the screen. Um, I would probably take a step back and again, think about exactly what it is that you're building out. Um, do the icons make sense? Does the placement make sense? Uh, the layout, all that stuff. Um, yeah, with, without knowing more, I actually you're going to hear this a lot from UX designers. Uh, whenever we're asked a question, we always kind of answer, well, it depends, because it really does depend. Like, everything for us is contextual. 
like everything for us is based on the circumstances that led to that problem or led to that event. So sometimes, and the reason why that is, is for us, a lot of times what you probably say is the problem, it's very likely isn't the actual problem. Um, so we like to understand the whole context of the situation in order to really address the real problem at its source rather than just putting a band-aid on, on just like a little, you know, paper cut. Um, you made the mock-up, but when you tested the UI in UE, UE4, it's not attractive or functional. So the attractive side, talk to your artist about that. Um, the functional side, though, I, if it's not working, you're going to have to go back to the drawing board. You're going to have to go back and actually look at the current problems that it's going through. Um, again, like I said before, making sure that you have the right information being displayed um, on screen is kind of really important. Um, you don't want more information than you need, and obviously you don't want less than, than you need. Um, if when I tap a button and it's not, it's just taking me from screen to screen and that's it, uh, probably what's missing is a little more of that interaction design side of things. So you have to look at button taps or any sort of like accessing any sort of UI as more of a process, I would say, or as more of a, a sequence of events. There we go. Um, when I tap the button, what does the state change look like on the tapped state? When I let go of the button, what is that button look like when I let it go. When the game registers that I tapped a button or when it lets go or whatever. Um, what sequence of events happens in order for me to get the output or the feedback that I'm looking for? Is it just literally I tapped a button and now here's the screen that just popped up out of nowhere? Or is there a sort of like progression into that screen? Um, a really, really, I. I would say a really good example is Persona 5. Um, I think we've talked about this before a few times. I have love-hate relationship with Persona 5, but their transitions from screen to screen are so incredibly beautiful and dynamic, and they're just the quality of them and what they add to the game and the personality and everything are, is just so great. And it's because they looked at each transition and each button step and each uh, selection as as a whole like means to an end rather than just I tapped it and here's the end um, so maybe you might need to look at that if you're saying it's not functional um, I mean if it's literally it's not functional and the button is just not working like if you tap it and nothing's happening then engineer <laughs> help Come. But if it's more uh, conceptually uh, not functioning, um, it's not conveying the information that you want it to convey and all that stuff, then you have to start looking at the state changes and, and actually mocking out those state changes. Um, I, every single thing I mock out, I look at it as a whole process, as a transition from one point to the next before it reaches the end goal and sometimes that whole transition is like half a second that's fine but just popping things in and out of the screen is jarring for people uh, and especially for players um, so you want it to just kind of flow you want it to flow from one point to the next and that's what I would kind of like go back to the drawing board and look at if that's the situation that's happening. And with the uh, Manny, just in case, with the UI, if it's not attractive, 
again, maybe it's like really early state. And if it's just early state, that's fine. But even with all the polish and everything, you feel like it's still not there. I would continue to push your artists. Um, and it could be likely that the way the UI is handled doesn't match the visual style of the game itself. So if we, and this is a gen very, very generic general example. Um, let's say I'm making a game like Dead Space or making a game like Overwatch or something like that. And all of my UI looks like Candy Crush. That is not gonna look great overlaid on the game. Like it looks very disjointed. It looks like it belongs in two completely separate games. Um, so if that's also what's kind of happening, um, again, work with your artist, uh, sit down, kind of like look back at your reference sheets. Um, in fact, look at other references. It's really great. Like I, I love working off a reference because I know exactly the vision that you have in your head when, when you show me like, you know, this game, I really like what this game is doing. Um, and it doesn't mean I'm going to do exactly what they're doing. I'm still going to tailor the designs to the game that we're making. But just seeing, again, that vision in your head in physical form um, points me in the right direction. And maybe that's what you need to do, too. You just have to sit down with them and, and show them what you're thinking. All right, folks, so I'm going to go ahead, actually, and, and just go ahead and end the stream now. But thank you so much for having me. Um, again, if you want to reach out to me, you can do it at Korapiki uh, on Twitter, uh, here through Facebook. Um, I do have an Instagram, but I don't use it at all. Um, and yeah, and on Discord as well, on the PRGDA uh, Discord. Uh, definitely recommend you join that. You can reach out to me there as well. I hope you have a good night, everyone. Bye.